Thank you, Emily. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at Venture Cafe for the first virtual artist studio tour of the year. Tonight, I'm very excited to present the work of Philadelphia-based glass and sculpture artist, James LeBold. Um, James's work uses contemporary and historical imagery to create imagined narratives that reflect on the connection between our past and present culture. James gets his inspiration from found objects and mass produced items, as well as classical sculpture. His love of history, mythology, and philosophy drive his work into how our culture is defined with images. So James received his BFA from Temple University and his MFA from Ball State University in Indiana, both in glass. Um, he's exhibited his work extensively throughout the United States and has received numerous prestigious awards, such as the Glass Art Society's Sachs Emerging Artist Award and the Rome and Haas Fine Art Achievement Award. So now I'd like to um, go ahead and welcome our guest, James LeBold. Hey, James. Hi, thanks for having me. Of course, for thank deep, you for coming. Deep cut with that Roman Haas Fine Art Achievement Award. <laughs> it was a long time ago. I don't know if Roman Haas is even a company anymore. Um, <laughs> but uh, that was a good, that was, uh, thanks for having me. Um, of <laughs> So I have um, coming live from my luxurious basement, um, which used to used to be a primary studio for me uh, in some regards. And after COVID became a, a primary studio again for some new stuff. Um, so I have a presentation of, of some of my work that I can give a little more insight to and show some examples and um, sort of a little bit about my influences in the past where sort of my ideas came from and some of my processes and towards the end i'll get a little bit into what's going on behind me uh, in the new basement studio um, so should i go ahead and share a screen or all right i'm gonna share the screen uh <clears throat> I might need a little. Uh... Emily, I think he needs co-host status. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's oh, got no. it. Oh, no, when he came back, he lost it. I'm so oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. You're now a re-co-host. <laughs> okay, so I will share a screen. Here we go. Let me just put this in. Uh, Mm. looks good thanks <laughs> <laughs> um so before i like dive too into this i guess i i do want to again like thank you venture cafe for having me uh thanks angela um you know my wife and i were talking about like how we met and uh it's just like very cool uh you know, it was like comics jam a million years ago. That That's right. Came at, you know, like 10 years ago or probably more than that now. I it's, uh, yeah, I think it's more than 10. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's just uh, one of the things I love about this city and the, like the art community here. And, uh, you know, it's good to see people like continuing to pursue their passions. And uh, it's great that this has like come out of that. So. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I kind of hadn't thought about comics jam in a while. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> to everyone else, it was like a group where we met once a month and drew comics. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of like a, uh, exquisite corpse kind of situation, but with comic strips. Um, yeah. so, you know, many different creative pursuits. Anyhow, <laughs> um, <laughs> and it was a weird bunch, uh, who are mostly <laughs> still weird from what I've kept up with. So, oh, for sure. um, Anyhow, so uh, as Angela said, uh, I have a BFA in glass from Tyler School of Art, Temple University. Um, I grew up in the area. I grew up in Bucks County and my whole family is in sort of Philadelphia for as long as the Rizzle Bulls around the United States. So, um, you know, I, I guess I have personal and family history here to some regards. Um, 
you know, I left for a while, uh, lived in Arizona for a while, came back to Philadelphia. Um, I guess, you know, the dry heat wasn't for me and, uh, worked in mixed media glass, some screen printing for a while, even, um, then ended up going to graduate school quite a while after I'd been out of undergrad, uh, 10 years actually. So I actually appreciated graduate school, uh, and all those resources quite a bit. And after a little more bopping around, I came back. So without further ado, I will get into the real deal here. So over the last six years, I've done a lot of these sort of visiting artists, artist presentation, and I will talk a little bit about how my work has, uh, my process has been influenced or sort of utilized a traveling artist kind of idea. Um, so usually I'm giving this presentation to people that aren't from Philadelphia. So these first few slides will be redundant for those of you that are locals. Um, but obviously I spent, you no, know, typically I uh, introduce this like, I'm from Philadelphia. It was founded by William Penn, et cetera. Here's the city hall, um, you know, home, birthplace of, birthplace of democracy as we like to call, you know, Independence Hall and, uh, you know, Obviously we all know, or anyone that's based out of Philadelphia and lived here long enough knows we're you know, swimming in the colonial and revolutionary war era history. Uh, for me, I had more than enough field trips to all these sites and even family vacations to these revolutionary war sites. And these sort of like ideas of this, the ideals, I guess, of the founding of this nation were really ingrained in my education and the, what later I reflect on is sort of like a mythical or even like sort of a civil religious way, if you want to look at it like that. But on the other hand, we're, you know, famous for greasy sandwiches, uh, you know, extravagant dressing, debatably, you know, like we don't have to get into the politics. Uh, <laughs> we'll get there later. And, uh, you know, notoriously, you know, famous for this underdog movie and which has a sculpture right next to one of the greatest museums i think uh in the world i spent a lot of time going here as a child and influenced me early as an artist um i do think works of like marcel duchamp you know this sort of idea the ready-made and found object came to influence me a lot over the years although my earliest inspiration to even explore sculpture came from the Rodin Museum. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, the Rodin Museum in Philadelphia is the largest collection of Rodin's work outside of Paris. Um, but really, I grew up in Newtown, which is in Bucks County, um, which is the first town founded after Philadelphia. Uh, and I guess like William Penn just ran out of inspiration after naming Philadelphia, and the Newtown was named Newtown. Uh, but short drive out of the city, um, home of Edward Hicks, who is more known for Peaceable Kingdom. Uh, so some of my early work was, you know, I, I started out as a printmaker. I got interested in sculpture. I got interested in glass because it is this very immediate reactive medium that uh, it's very quick. It's, you don't have a lot of time to work with it. It's hot. It's uh, it's very intense, but short, short-lived. Um, and I started making these sort of uh, almost, I would say, like sort of reimagined contemporary uh, shrines, you know. So early on, I was always using glass and mixed media, always a lot of found objects that were sort of supplementing, uh, initially, to be honest, supplementing my sculpting abilities. You know, I, I couldn't sculpt everything I wanted to, but I could often find it at a thrift store. Um, one of the things that about glass that is, is less convenient is it's very expensive. <laughs> it's not so convenient when you're not a student, when you're not working for a university. Um, there are public access studios, but shop rental time is expensive. And when I found myself outside of school, I sort of just honed in on using the found objects themselves and continuing with this sort of shrines and a uh, consumer, sort of an imagined consumer culture cult, if you will. Oh, Occasionally I would get access to glass and 
reincorporate sculpted elements. This was a self portrait at some point. Uh, it's pretty old, so the digital quality is not great, but that is a horse from behind at the center. Um, <laughs> Just real quick, can you tell us like why it's so hard to like why glass is so expensive? Um, make essentially like any like hot glass is is run out of like a, a furnace that is typically running twenty four hours a day. So if a studio is a, like a private production studio, you know, for them they really have to be you know making their product profitable to keep their sort of keep the gas on. Um, the private or sort of public access studios that you can rent time at typically start around $30 an hour for like a, um, a very small amount of access. Um, so it sort of becomes quickly limiting to like, if you want to experiment, do you have, you know, $200 to mess around for a day? And then it it sort of starts to feel like, well, if I'm going to rent time in the studio, I have to make something that I know I can gonna sell. So I should make some Christmas ornaments and vases, you know? And uh, I've made my share of Christmas ornaments and vases and there's nothing wrong with making things to get by. But, um, you know, if you're sort of working in a studio, often you'll have some sort of access as a perk. Um, but typically if, if you're not attached to them and you're just renting it, um, you know, it's purely the gas bills, I mean, or electric. There are shops that are running off electric furnaces, but again, it's a lot of electricity that's running all day long. Um, so it can quickly become cost prohibitive. <laughs> uh, and especially, you know, I worked at a glass studio when I was in Arizona and had Friday nights to experiment. And that was very generous of, of the shop owner, you know, um, but it was also usually Friday night after a full week of work and, you know, inspired or not, uh, sometimes you just don't physically have a lot of energy to get out at that point, you know? Uh, you've already worked your 40 plus hours, so getting getting your masterpiece done is like, you know, maybe not gonna happen before dinner. Um, but yeah, so that's a little bit of why it's kind of costly. Um, it's not so much the glass, it's everything that goes into making it molten, so. Um, so in terms of this sort of like, this idea of a civil religion or a sort of national mythology, um, you know, I've always been interested in how we've sort of, we being like the United States have incorporated a lot of uh, neoclassical architecture, imagery, and sort of co-opted uh, sort of Roman and Greek, both the ideals and the imagery and the icons of that. So this is the Capitol Dome, uh, in Washington DC and this is the apotheosis of Washington so for those of you that don't aren't really familiar with this uh sort of mythological jargon the apotheosis is like the uh, sort of ascending to heaven um and every one of these figures is an allegorical figure representing some you know liberty revolution you know oceans land you know um it sort of goes to me almost counter to this idea of a democracy and that it's like turning our founders. I mean, immediately George Washington, the first one, we, we turn him into a God-like figure. Um, our sort of, you know, symbols of our government are modeled on these historical temples. There's a sort of, you know, implication that the Supreme Court is, is a temple. I mean, it's, it's directly based on the Parthenon. Um, and to some extent, that was like a very conscious decision to incorporate these sort of classical forms to allude to the Greco-Roman sort of traditions of democracy and republicanism. And on the other hand, I've always been interested in just symbols in general, what they mean and how they change over time. Uh, so now most of us, you know, in recent years or uh, this sort of all seeing eye and I, the pyramid has become more closely associated with conspiracy theories, um, Illuminati and whatnot, and whatever we're onto now in conspiracy theory world. But, uh, you know, its origin goes back to Freemasonry, this idea of like a benevolent or like omnipotent benevolent force that's watching over us. Um, 
but that eye that use of the eye is like directly connects back to the eye of horus in egypt which still have that idea of like a deity watching over and protecting you so now to some actual artwork and that i made um <laughs> So this interest in like the neoclassical, the classical and it being reinterpreted for contemporary purposes or in not so contemporary, but sort of national purposes or national myth-making has inspired me a lot, as I said, this is just some early work, early as in a few years ago, but uh, older work. Uh, this idea of like a facade being a sort of you know, a term we use both as like a physical architectural detail, but also something we use to imply like a, a false front in a way. Um, these are some glass pieces. Uh, they are using this hot blow mold process, which is a lost wax process. I'll talk a little bit more about the details of the process later. Um, in the US Capitol, there's uh, where they would have you know, the capitals of columns, as opposed to being like a traditional Roman form, they actually, instead of having acanthus leaves and sort of the traditional things you see on, uh, you know, many columns, but a traditional Roman or Greek column, uh, they actually incorporated corn and tobacco leaves to make them more like an American version of uh, the classical capital. Um, so I took these and sort of built these off uh, just a basic form, but made molds and assembled these forms in wax, then transferred them into glass. Um, so this is another sort of extent of this, this idea of like the national myth-making uh, divisive ruling uh, in thinking about the Supreme Court and thinking about this sort of body that's sort of the final body of all you know, legal rulings in the US is composed of nine people with differing opinions and different perspectives. Um, the the female figure I actually found, it, I found a rubber mold in the trash, uh, which was like a mega trash find for me because I didn't have to make a mold of anything. I already found the mold. Um, but then I manipulated that figure by adding, you know, the traditional like blind justice attributes, some neoclassical architectural details at the bottom and a little difficult to see from a form but it is actually assembled it was made in nine sections and there's like nine distinct sections of it um not that like any of it necessarily correlates but when i made this it was a more evenly divided cord than it is now which is why it's half red and half blue um you know so in my time in graduate school i also sort of started exploring neon and had you know had access to that um it's another thing that like i think plays with the low culture and the pop culture side of things that i'm engaged in um but i tried to sort of incorporate that into into using some of the same imagery um he has looked favorably upon our undertakings is like a loose translation of what's on the back of the great seal on every dollar bill um it's a new order of the ages and he has looked favorably upon our undertakings um these are a bunch of hands and then sorry i don't have a great detail shot of this all the hands are actually a set of praying hands that are divided in half and made into just hand hands reaching out there's like objects from space race and then like elvis and pop culture you know both like high and low again this little beefcake guys a big favorite of mine so cake topper um so i am also very interested in how these kitsch objects are made or like decisions like you know i don't know the decisions i made and so went into making them um but at one point in time i was able to access a bunch of slip cast molds so molds for making ceramic pieces um and these were old production molds that i could repurpose to form wax sculptures and then form glass castings out of. Um, and most of them seem to be from the 60s, maybe the 70s at the latest, but I have an auction junkie friend who called me up and said, I got a building full of molds, come take your pick. Um, luckily, I found this astronaut and I thought we had this like 
you know, it was clearly made during the early days of the space race. Uh, there was sort of this like confident, ar almost arrogant, like uh, just something that like a sort of, you know, I made this, um, you know, in the, this was like second Obama era. There was already a lot of the divisiveness that's going on now that was becoming part of national politics. And I felt like that like national pride and unity that like came out of space race era, like that was showing through in this cheesy object, you know, maybe it didn't so much exist anymore, but this was also at the time where they had stopped using the space shuttle or they had just announced it or it was like happening. So it was this idea that like our space race, it kind of, kind of petered out and, you know, fast forward a few years and we got SpaceX and all that stuff. But um, so I reinterpret this as an Icarus form. Uh, the wings are actually from like another one of the slip cast molds as is the base. So, um, I mentioned a little bit and Angela mentioned a little bit, you know, sort of influence of classical sculpture and classical architecture. Um, but I'm as much influenced by contemporary work, obviously political work um, and modernism. And at first glance, this is probably a pile of Abe Lincoln heads like does not scream modernism or classical anything. Um, but I had both this uh, Abraham Lincoln bust and this John F. Kennedy bust. Um, and I think, you know, as sort of historical anomalies of being assassinated, there's all these like uh, Lincoln was shot in the Ford Theater, Kennedy was shot in the Ford uh, Lincoln Town Car, you know. Um, I think those are uh, like, it's a little conspiracy theory-ish, but just by chance, I have these two heads. One was made out of a plaster, a plaster cast mold, the other was slip cast. JFK actually seems to be like a little less attractive in in bust form and Lincoln seems to be a little better looking, uh, a little bit maybe connected to the processes that they were made in. But, you know, they both sort of, to me, bookend this like, uh, they were, you could look at both their assassinations as, as being connected to like the civil movements that were going on at the time of the civil war and the civil rights movement and that like the civil rights movement was a natural extension of like what theoretically should, you know, should have been resolved right by the end of the civil war or at the civil war, but a hundred years later, a president is like assassinated. Um, and, you know, motives aside, like, I think, I think it can draw a connection between those two. And also that it is sort of shocking that that took a hundred years and now, you know, we're, another 60 years on and, and still reckoning with some of these issues. Um, the form was, uh, well, there's another one. Okay, I gotta jump back. The form of these was inspired by Constantine Brancusi's Endless Column, which this is a smaller version of it. Brancusi made lots of iterations of this form, but uh, the largest one is a monument to war heroes or war dead in Hungary, in Hungary I believe, maybe speaking there um so this is sort of like my me like riffing on both like modernism some classical uh classical sort of sculpture or traditional sculpture that's been filtered through kitsch um this again i was making a lot of uh, towers this is like pretty this is around from the same time so 2015 ish um you know, my thoughts was this is a this was an Avon perfume bottle that was in the shape of the U.S. Capitol building. You know, um, I don't. It's like a weird like is that is that like a, a a way to like respect the the like you're really into the Senate and Cong Congress, so you want an Avon bottle? I don't know. It's very like kitschy, just cheesy, and I don't think people think a lot about it. But that's I get really interested in like what do these objects mean like what I thought like is this a coded message from Avon that Congress stinks um so I molded the original bottle and then repeated it over and over again to kind of create this form of like uh the Capitol building sort of crumbling under under its own weight under its own bureaucracy um 
you know, <laughs> things were like, seemed, I don't know, that was like when they were holding up Merrick Garland's nomination back then. I don't know, you know, like a, a simpler time when, uh, yeah, we'll get there. Um, so I also like take some of these objects, especially the neon and work them into installation. So, you know, I have independent sort of sculptures that operate on their own as just pedestal or whatever. Um, but I do still really love like bring found objects and fabricated objects collaging them together all of this is like for me assemblage or three-dimensional collage is a way of you know filtering all these images like through my brain smoothing them back out in this sort of like uh visualized process of me trying to reconcile uh the ideals that we're supposed to be founded on uh the sort of like hyper consumer culture that we're a part of uh the sort of fanaticism that goes along with all of that. Um, so, you know, again, this was like a lot of congressional bickering and, and there was always this, we have to compromise, we have to reach across the aisle and then getting nowhere. And um, this is my like tongue in cheek little take on that. But the Pegasus, you know, on one hand, this is a rocking horse. This is a toy like beat up pony, you know, um, but transformed into a Pegasus, but, um, bringing some sort of imagined myth to that. Um, again, in like the installation realm, uh, the myth is real. This was like several vignettes that predominantly were, you know, found objects in neon with glass elements. Um, I sort of viewed it as like a whole installation, but also as sort of smaller subsections. Um, so monumental failure, this is like a 12 or 13 foot tall sort of obelisk uh, meant to look like it's both under construction or sort of crumbling. Um, you know, like the plaster is chippy. It's made out of like low budget materials. The neon all works, but it's sort of jumbled like it got dropped. Um, but there's still this like illuminating eye at the top. At the very, very top is a security uh, mirror so like the viewer can see themselves like directly being watched by the eye um then in the other corner is eye in the sky these planes are actually silhouettes based on the pattern of a predator drone and pretty accurately um you know that was like the level there was a lot of predator drone things going on at that point in time um you know simpler again simpler times i guess uh but this is the sort of idea of like a over a eye watching over us could also be reinterpreted as a surveillance state, you know, uh, it, you know, is the eye benevolent or, you know, not so benevolent. Um, this is actually an existing column in the gallery that was oddly in the middle of the gallery. Um, so my solution was like, it was really messing with the flow of my mental version of this installation. So I just had to make it part of it. So there's these rotating sort of spiral of shelves and all across. Yeah. So there's all these little like vignettes of found objects. Some of them are like fully assembled, like could be taken off as individual sculptures. Some of them are just arrangements. So this is cheerleaders from a trophy, uh, praying hands holding a predator, a predator drone model um and then it's all surrounded with leds and neons sort of give this like mystical electric appearance um and at the time you know this is the silent majority crashes fdr's party this was more about like this idea of like fdr's four pillars of freedom um for freedom speech which is uh like this big foundational idea of just like I'm not going to get too into them, but that this sort of long view of uh, the dismantling of all these social programs, uh, I don't think I realized like there would be actual party crashing the day before this talk. Um, but, man, you know, <laughs> I was going to say this is like so relevant. <laughs> yeah, like I'm really like timing wise. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, I think, you know, I made a lot of this stuff and it was like the Obama era and people were like, what are you, what are you all like worked up about? Or why are you making this work? And to me, I was like, well, I'm looking at like the infighting and the narrative and like, where does this go? And I certainly did not foresee the last four years, but 
um you know i i wish it stayed more like imaginary but um <laughs> It makes some cool sculpture. I like, you know, I like the work out of it. I just, I feel like it, it, uh, it hits harder for me now than it did when I made it. And then, you know, um, I don't think I could have imagined that like actually happening. This was all this sort of imagined dystopian narrative uh, with neon illuminating it. Um, so there's like a couple of snakes in the back twisting together, fighting together. Um, these clouds are all neon and insulation foam um there's like four full columns although one is like almost non-existent because it's in shards um well, that got in there twice um so at some points i do incorporate both the neon and blown glass like a little more closely um this is actually made um with some like uh black light neon tubing and sensitive glass that illuminates under that um, and this is just sort of like another iteration of this, like repeating the figure and repeating, um, like repeating a pattern or repeating a figure. To me, I think when you look at history, like what I was taught as history, what we all have been taught, um, it, it changes like over time, like history has this malleable nature. You know, they always say like, it's written by the victors, and, but it's not just written by like, the victors of a certain incident like history is you know part of our like cultural narrative and that that shifts with time you know um you know lincoln is now sort of this uh you know sort of icon you know almost like untouchable presidential figure but i mean arguably pretty divisive like in his day you know um i think Obviously, I think he was on the right side of history in the end, but even getting there was a little messy, but we don't like to get into the messy details of history. Um, so for me, like repeating these figures, manipulating the forms sort of like plays off of that a little bit. Um, now we're getting a little more contemporary. <laughs> so this is the same form. Uh, this is when there was a lot of talk about draining swamps and uh, you know, I was thinking of more of a puddle, but, um, uh, you know, I'd like play on words. So capitalize or, or capitalizing, um, I think the capitalizing on this, this whole narrative worked out, uh, for someone. Um, <laughs> so before I get too much into more of the current stuff, I just want to talk a little bit about processes that I've showed you the work, most of the work I've showed you has used, uh, they're lost wax form they start as wax positives i use a lot of found objects that i make rubber molds out of um, and you can see some bits and pieces laying around here uh, i then take those different forms of waxes and collage them together so this is that same jfk head i used before um, i was teaching a workshop in like bavaria germany uh, so there's this like famous jfk uh, mispronunciation where he said ich bin ein Berliner meaning to say like I'm a Berliner or we're all Berliners and he said I'm a donut in translation uh, <laughs> so all the Germans like knew this joke way more than I, I had, like just learned it before I went there um, just doing a little research but so there is a donut on the back of him and uh, a lot of these were objects that I found while I was there that I was able to make molds of and on the right uh, is the final glass form. So uh, that is a very bad cell phone picture, but the original piece is somewhere in Germany still, or maybe Belgium. But here's two others like in process shots where you can see the wax form, uh, how it's all collaged together. And then in the end, uh, once I have that wax, I make a mold of it. So this is a wax form inside of a mold, melt the wax out, take the mold into a glass studio, heat that mold up, pull it out. These are some students at a workshop I taught in Wisconsin. Um, and what they're doing is blowing glass into a bubble, in a glass bubble into the mold. Um, a lot of people use this process for casting. Um, and then now there's like myself and a handful, you know, a handful of people that are working regularly with this process, but actually blowing glass into these forms. Um, here's me with a bigger one. Um, it's a lot of standing around waiting for things to cool off. So it's usually a good time to, you know, 
take some goofy photos up there. Um, but so the form has to sort of be uh, something that a bubble can evil, easily travel to, but it will get this high level of detail like any casting would. Um, the difference between like the casting glass and blowing is temperature wise, uh, you could cast glass at 2000 degrees or anywhere between 1500 and 2000, spend a lot of time in an oven, has a lot of time to travel into all kinds of nooks and crannies. This is a very fast process. Uh, once the mold is up, it's like 15 minutes of me blowing glass into it. Um, but it gets all the it gets all the detail, all the surface detail. So for example, this piece is cut into sections, but it's just two views of the same wax piece. And this is the final piece uh, in glass. And I make it out of clear glass usually and use a variety of pigments and mixed medias to finish them. Um, you know, I like the idea of like using the translucency and transparency. Um, some things like being more transparent than others, I think piggybacks a little bit on my ideas about history and, and how we view ourselves. Um, this is actually one that I was in that picture of blowing the mold of. Um, so this came a little later, like after I returned to Philly, um, after I finished in Indiana, I taught out there for a year and then I moved on to doing some residencies. I came back to Philly after like three or three and a half years, um, or close, to, close to four, I guess, um, not three and a half. Um, and I didn't have a studio, I didn't have anything, I could do my little wax assemblages in a basement and, and I was able to get a couple of these opportunities lined up where I would go as a visiting artist and basically show up with a bunch of waxes and maybe molds and, you know, do a lecture, not unlike this, but also do demonstrations for students and in exchange, get like some gas money and get to make my sculptures. So um, this was all modeled, molded, all that work was done in Philadelphia. I took it with me with a bunch of other stuff to Detroit, to College for Creative Studies out there. Did a week long thing, hung out with the students, had a great time, uh, brought it back to Philadelphia, finished it, did all my sort of top coat painting, whatnot. Um, and then weirdly enough, sent it back to Detroit for to a gallery <laughs> like a year later. Um, but this is playing off this. Uh, this is really when I was starting to, we were in the midst of, you know, right after Parkland and there was like this really amazing, powerful movement of like all these youth. It was like, I felt like the first, I don't know, it was a very sad thing to be motivating people, but it was like a very inspiring to see these like youth really motivating about gun control and like reaction, the response from youth about gun violence, like all across the country um so i in like a rare like hopeful moment from james lebold this was sort of my like vision of like you know the the end of that wisdom of like guns 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 and um because you know i think there's valid arguments for self-defense and whatnot but i think a lot is driven by like factor profits you know by keeping things sold so there's sort of cherubs like busting up pistols and guns um on the other hand, like I always have to have the sort of alternate view of things worked into this. So the owl, while it is on one hand a symbol of wisdom that we most know it at, most of us know it as, um, you know, it also is a harbinger of death in many cultures. Um, so I like that sort of uh, duality of that image. Um, this is a sort of piggybacking on some of the earlier work we saw, but actually putting Kennedy and Lincoln together again. So again, these are from the same original wax molds and the same heads that I've just like made over, reworked, manipulated. Um, this is a little larger. It's a uh, truncated column from the visible hand. Um, like again, playing with the sort of neoclassical reinterpretation of things. Um, I'm going to speed up because I realize I've been going on for a long time on this presentation. I'm sorry. Um, this is like more current. Or this is actually a couple of years ago. And I want to get this one in there and say, you know, if you're not familiar with Goya's, you know, Francisco Goya, 
you know, 200 years ago almost, or maybe, you know, did this Disasters of War and Los Caprichos, and there's this famous image that's the title, it's in Spanish, but, you know, the title is The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. Um, and, you know, uh, <laughs> I feel like the evidence of Sleep of Reason is very, uh, very just showed its head yesterday. Um, and then this is, again, from a couple, two years ago, almost, that it made this, but this Den of Snakes uh, is another blown glass piece, but I think, like, uh, I think, I guess that saw that coming. Um, <laughs> this is, again, another piggybacking on the, the same idea of, like, the ruinous nature of gun violence and sort of the, the debate around it, and but there's sort of this, like, hopeful youth, which is a knockoff Michelangelo's David at the top. Um, 2020, I'm going to like zoom through this because I want to get times for questions and all that. Um, obviously, my practice was based on traveling. Like I would make waxes in my basement and then I would go wherever I could make glass and teach a workshop and um, bring the stuff home. And then, you know, I had a, I had that, like I had a swing going and I had some residencies lined up this year and some shows lined up. COVID hit, obviously, um, I was afraid to even go. I finally got a studio outside of my house and I was afraid to even go there, you know, um, for a while until I cracked. Um, but, uh, in that time I just decided to like get a 3d printer because I could do that in my basement and cliff notes version is like six years ago, someone who I, assisted at a residency was like you should get into 3d like you should get into 3d printing you can you can doubt like if you love found objects you could just print like all these objects so um there's a, this initiative called scan the world um which many museums around the world are taking part of where they're offering free 3d scans of their collections and um this is just a screenshot of it but uh you can find like Google them. It's super cool. Even if you're not into printing, it's very interesting to like open these files and inspect masterpieces like way closer than you ever would get to, right? Um, but I'm taking their files, which this is like they encourage remixing, reusing. You know, many of them have completely like public domain free licensing. Um, I take it in this mesh mixer program to edit it manipulate it there so i'm sort of translating what i was doing with wax but like digitally which took a lot to learn that then i print it out <laughs> then i make a rubber mold of it i don't have a picture of the mold but these are plaster castings from that mold so i can make like small additions of these pieces um ultimately they'll like be translated into glass plaster resin like many other things but uh the last four months I've really just been like playing on my computer in my basement with these prints. Um, so that uh, went, I'm sorry, longer than- <laughs> Oh, that was great. I loved <laughs> um, it. But that last piece, just, I wanted to show this because I am like really stoked about the 3D printing, but the events of the last few days have made me feel like I should have focused on the old, older work a little. Um, but that last screenshot was, uh, so this is like the top part of it, that piece, I ran out of that color. So this is the middle. Um, and then I still have to print the third part, but if it was running, you guys wouldn't be able to hear me. Um, and then assemble them and mold make. Um, and, uh, you know, so that, uh, yeah, I'm, I'll take some questions if there's some questions. Uh, <laughs> well, I just have a quick question for you. So, you know, all of your work seems to be influenced by history and politics in some way. Um, how has 2020 kind of influenced your subject matter or what you're thinking about making in the future? Yeah. Um, I know I kind of like glanced over it pretty quickly, but my processes are uh, slow, like really slow. And then I added 3D printing, which like that print took like five days total for the two parts, you know? Um, and I think that's good for me because it gives me a lot of time to reflect on things like before I actually put that piece out in the world and that they don't get to be just a political cartoon. Because obviously like anyone, I'm reacting like very immediately to what's happening. And uh, 
want to create things, but for me, it's like, I want to jot some things down or doodle some ideas. And, you know, I do try to focus a little bit like on that historical view and the bigger, like sort of meta narratives of our like national culture and, and like how that ties into global culture too. You know, I don't want it to be that I'm purely US centric, but this is where I live. And I think like, this is the culture that I'm going to reflect back in the work I make. And uh, the reflections have not been particularly like pretty than the last couple of years, you know, um, I think all that 2020 like isolation time, uh, you know, between COVID, uh, you know, all like the Black Lives Matter protests over the summer, um, the like what all this stuff in the last couple of days, all these sort of rising sort of uh conspiracy theory people coming out of the woodwork uh it's so much to respond to and um i haven't made anything that's like 100 percent new and done and respond like i feel like i've started these bits and pieces um but for me it's like a little easier in a way to start responding to it like in a historical view or with some old things and like work my way up to the present, you know, like it took me a long time to make like those, uh, the two gun violence connected pieces. Like that took me like a full year after Parkland to even have those like ready to really display, you know, um, cause I want to be like thoughtful about it. I want to be timely about it and, uh, just consider it about, uh, contemporary issues. And especially sometimes when the landscape's changing, like so rapidly, you know, it's, are you going to make a sculpture about like some event that no one remembered two days later? I mean, I think some events we know will be going down in history uh, from the last 48 hours, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to take my time. <laughs> There's a lot to take in. It takes a lot to process things too. So yeah. I'd like James, I'm, my name's Margarita and I'm a ceramicist. So I've done years of bronze. So I really, really appreciate your process and the time and this time that we're living in is um and it's beautiful work and the symbols in it really hit home so many so many of them but uh this time is is such a time of reflection this this year that we've all been coming we're coming out of and it, everything has felt really slow for me too but i feel like the world had to stop for a moment and hopefully it to wake up but that time thing has really hit me. And my work does take a long time too, but I really feel you and hear you. And uh, taking some time is good, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it's important, but I can't wait to see what you will be doing. Really, really exciting work and uh, really beautifully crafted. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I don't, I don't talk a lot about it, but you know, glasses and this like craft media history, just like, uh, ceramics and, and there's this element of like uh it would be so much easier to make this out of another material but when you work in glass <laughs> like you or you guys when you work in bronze you make the thing like seven times it's like yeah <laughs> it's really something it, it's a it's definitely a, a seasoned um process so yeah i think it's good for me though like it does slow me down and I need to learn through epic failure, you know, like I really don't, <laughs> I don't think unless I waste, you know, a hundred hours on something, then I'll like learn a little bit of some, a little piece of information for the next one. Um, Cause I think the failure is important, but I do like uh, appreciate, you know, there, the, there's a craft, like a lot of craftsmanship goes into it. And yeah. On the other hand, I love, you know, slapping some neon on, rocking horse I found in the garbage you know that's like not well crafted <laughs> when, it's, when it's a little bit faster and I feel like um how adaptive we are as, as artists we really it's our life but this time has really even put us into like being even more adaptive and the way that we're working and the way maybe you're not you're working in a different but getting the 3d printer during uh the lockdown and stuff any I just think it's I really am often in awe about artists we keep it's such a 
a tribe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you it's like you find a way, right? I, I yeah. first, when we first went into lockdown, uh, I very quickly knew this show I was going to have in Detroit was canceled. And then like real quickly found out this residency was going to be canceled. And I was like, I started out as a printmaker. So I got, I had some like wood and I had carving tools. So I like tried to do some wood block stuff. And it was like helpful. You know, I wasn't working and I had something to be creative, but it was like something was missing. Uh, and, you know, I was like, I had to, and maybe- I knew I didn't, I knew I wasn't going to make something about like what was happening every day, but it was important to me to like, have a creative outlet especially once it was not my, my day job was shut down so i was like i can just doom scroll for 16 hours a day or <laughs> i can try to make some art um i gotta say i'm glad i got the 3d printer but i definitely bit off more than i expected to with that you know i thought hey, i get a printer and it print stuff and then oh yeah i have to like learn all these digital modeling programs um yeah. And of course, by that point, I was back at my day job. You know, we were allowed to be open again because it's like manufacturing. And uh, I was like, man, I had all the time in the world three months ago to learn these programs and watch yeah. tutorials all day. I blew it. Um, they have th- ceramic 3D printers too, you know. Yeah. Um, there's some people that have been doing some of these ceramic 3D printers and uh, blowing glass into things that are ceramic 3D printed. Um, there's a, there is a, the MIT made a glass 3D printer and they just look like really funny blobby vases. They're like very beautiful, but they like, it's very impressive that they made it, you know, but it's like. Uh, but 3D printers <laughs> are so slow. So how would you like get the glass out in time? It's like, uh, cause the 3D printer does heat up filament and like squish okay. it out of nozzle, right? So it becomes molten. Yeah, so, sure. um the glass like there's like a furnace with a plug that is like the nozzle at the bottom and then a bed that moves around and like takes the direction but I mean they're beautiful objects but it's like all right guys you got like a lot of work to do before like you got first glass 3d printer but you got a lot of work to do (laughs) before it's like printing every anything other than some lumpy vases the ceramic ones are already like yeah they're pretty advanced James, you should look up the work of Bob Arneson. He's a San Francisco based, he's a pioneer in ceramics. Oh, and, I know him. You know, <laughs> I mean, I don't know him personally, but I love his work, yeah. He's so irreverent. And um, I think that he, I was thinking about uh, him with looking at your work. Yeah, um, yeah, I love, love his work. You know, you. it's like just that uh, humor, but like culturally, like, you know, uh, sort of like a it's snarky but it's like on point and uh beautifully made you know uh, yeah <laughs> yeah i'm a big fan <laughs> cool. so just real quick i know we're coming up on the end does anyone else want to ask james a question or have any comments <laughs> I'll ask a quick question, okay. which is um, with all of your found objects, do you like, do you just have like a plethora of those or do you find them and then get inspired? I usually like find things that I'm very excited by, you know, like, uh, like the owl that I also use for like the Trump body that that's like a, well, actually that was an owl we bought to scare off squirrels from our garden that didn't work. Um, but I was like, this is a pretty cool model thing, you know, so I'll find, usually I'll find stuff that I enjoy and I just keep like a library of the molds. Um, so I make molds of them usually pretty quickly if I know it's like a object I really wanted to use in some way. Um, and then usually I clean them off and some of them I've kept around, but a lot of times I just give them back to thrift stores. So I just put them back in like the thrift store cycle from whence they came. Um, but every once in a while I find a thing that's like, I got to go, like, it really inspires the piece, you know, some of the pieces start with like, a they're coming from a specific viewpoint, I'm looking for the pieces to work with it to make the collage I want and other pieces really do come out of an object. You know? um, the Lincoln and Kennedy, you know, heads that really like, I, f- I found those o- objects like, uh, Lincoln came out of an old lamp factory on Front Street that is now like 
loft apartments or something, but there was a point when they were cleaning it out and they were like, come take a look. And Kennedy came out of that collection of slip cast molds. And both of those, like when I found them, I was like, all right, I gotta, gotta make a mold, gotta do a thing. And then I found Kennedy after I had the Lincoln. And when I found they were the same, like pretty close to the same size, that was when like, okay, like we're using both these and combining them like has to happen. You know? I'll keep you in mind if I ever find any good molds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so are you in Fishtown? Yeah, I'm in Fishtown. I'm in Northern Liberties. All right. Yeah, I found the uh, the divided uh, ruling, the um, the female figure, the blind justice. I found that that uh, rubber mold in the trash in Northern Liberties. Yeah. I was like going to dinner with my parents and I was like, oh, hold on. Sorry, dad. <laughs> I have to pick trash real quick. Uh, but my parents are very supportive. So <laughs> it's a good find. <laughs> yeah, that was like one of the, you know, I'm not usually actually trash picking, yeah, it's usually <laughs> for stores and stuff, but. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much, James, for being here tonight. And thanks to everyone for coming. Um, I loved taking a deep dive into your work and the subject matter. And I really appreciate how eloquent you are about talking about your thought process. So thank you so much. This yeah, thank awesome. you for having me. And uh, thanks. I know that was a lot of talking beforehand, but <laughs> I appreciate everyone's time. And uh, thanks again for having me. Okay, good night. Thank you, Angela. Thanks, Venture Cafe.